are we basically good or basically bad? <laughs> what what uh, what comes out of us in dire situations, uh, sur- situations of survival? Um, and uh, I don't think we need any further introductions. Um, is there anybody here that's new that was not here last week who wants to introduce themselves? No, I think we're on. Oh, you were here. Weren't you here last week, Deborah? I was here last yep. week, but I just realized that somebody is putting the shutters on the window right behind me. So if you see a person kind of <laughs> behind me, that's what's happening. They're not trying to sneak into my house through my window. Okay, but still stay stay unmuted so we can hear you. I'm going to mute because he's pounding, but I will unmute. We don't I- hear pound. We don't hear pounding. We don't hear. I think there's some some anti noise uh, mechanism okay. that prevents right. that from coming through. Yeah. If we right. if it gets noisy, I'll let you know and then you can unmute. But I'd like okay. to hear you. I'd like to, we okay. all like to hear you. Is there anything from Lord of the Flies that you want to? Uh, any unfinished business from last time that you want to start out with before we go into the uh, the real Lord of the Flies? What happened when six boys were shipwrecked for 15 months? Here, you know, uh, contributions there. I want to jump into the discussion question. What are your responses to reading this article, the real Lord of the Flies? What happened when six boys were uh, shipwrecked for five months? And we'll get those responses as we act, talk about various questions. My, um, how, was, how are they different? Let's do a little contrast. How, how are these two stories different? Anyone? Well, first off, they, they cooperate with each other and they agree not to have fights and they have timeouts. They, they do their own uh, disciplining of themselves, which I thought was really interesting. If they were really getting into it, they all said you need to time out and just stay put, uh, separate yourself for a while. And they divided up into teams and two people in each group did a, a thing like they were a fire keeper or they were a food confinder or whatever. Um, and I, I'm wondering if it's because there was a smaller group, there were only six of them, they all were more cohesive. Uh, I don't know if that helped with their cooperation or not, but they certainly had a different outcome than the Lord of the Flies, that's for sure. So. They also were friends, be, they were friends and conspirators before um, conspirators that's life. true <laughs> with a common <laughs> spirit yes mm-hmm. what about their ages older 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 and i think uh, much more mature in that regard they, they're more resourceful mm. and you had some older ones and younger ones and you, you tended in lord of the flies then to get a, a, a there are only a few older ones but there was a, a more of a, a power struggle, and then you had a younger set of folks that they were hoping would go one way or the other, depending on how they were motivated by the, the older mm. guys. Mm-hmm. We, um, we don't have all the information on this uh, group of, I'm trying to remember the island they came from. Uh, Tonga. They were, is that from it? Tonga. 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 Um, we don't have all the um, the nitty gritty uh, on their experience, the Tongan boys, because we just get basically the outcome and description. We don't know how easy it was for them to <clears throat> come to consensus on some of these issues. Um, uh, we don't have any uh, uh, of those details, whether that was they cooperated from the start or whether they needed to work it out. Uh, mm. that, would, that would be useful information. Um, um, but oh, it is. No. It was. It was heartening to to hear that they could uh, survive as they did. It Deborah, is, you know, Deborah? Uh, I was going to say in response to what Phil just said. Um, I I'm not sure if I remember this right or I have this right, but the interviews were not with the young men who were then grown up. The interviews were with. Um, the person who rescued them and then someone else who knew him. So, I mean, throughout, I kept thinking, well, why, why aren't they trying to find these actual people and yeah. um, interview them? I think the author was continuing to work in that regard. And it seems that they did, um, well, no, we're getting the story maybe to, to third hand. 
but my recollection is that once the boys were found, they were brought back to where they had escaped from and the owner of the boat was very upset and wanted to press mm. charges. And mm. as a way to kind of uh, ameliorate that, that problem, uh, the, the one who found them uh, said, well, if you will let me make a film out of this uh, and th let the boys maybe travel some and somehow he uh, diffused the situation where the boys would suddenly have to pay a severe penalty for what they did. And, and as a result of this, supposedly there was a film that was created. And of course, this fellow has had the story and he's writing a book as well. And this is featured in the book. The book is titled um, Humankind. And it's, it's, uh, it's available on, on Amazon. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and uh, so he's, he's, he's got, he, they're, they're, they're finding ways that they can make, bring good out of this misfortune. That what was, other, it was interesting ahead. after they were gone for 15 months and really had suffered quite a bit, they were put in jail. And, uh, you know, it just was so, sort of surprising. I imagine it was sort of surprising for them too, because you would think that they finally survived all this um, to be put in jail right away seemed mm -hmm. really harsh. Well, they did run away and they probably ran away from a fairly abusive situation. Um, having seen a little bit about um, some of these schools that were over there in that area of the world. Um, so it, it's not surprising that they came back to an abusive situation. Well, it was that the, they stole the boat. That's right. It was the right. owner of the boat who brought charges against him because he was mad they'd stolen the boat and of course it had been destroyed. So that's why they went, they were in jail. Right. And, and it's, it's, it's interesting too, that the, the parents, you know, they, the, this whole community had mourned the loss of these. Uh, they, they thought that they, they, you know, they, it was per, pretty much apparent, I guess, after the boat was just gone and the boys are gone, that they make the assumption that these boys did go on a fishing trip and perhaps were at sea and had, had a, 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 a situation hit them that, that took their lives. And so they had funerals and everything for each one of these boys. So they, the boys came back and could <laughs> have, start over again, so to speak. That, it, it had a good ending. Um, what, what did they find on their island, the boys? Chickens. Chickens. And how did they have chickens uh, on this island? Well, they, the people, the original people were taken away for slaves. And that's so right. they, they, the uh, island was abandoned. So whatever was there um, stayed behind. Although it sounded like at that point, the housing and stuff was gone, but they did find chickens. And um, yeah, that was, it was interesting because then that gave them a way to have food and stuff. It, it was, it was interesting. It was not wild pigs, but chickens. So. That's right. Much better <laughs> for all involved. And the chickens apparently had reproduced over generations. And uh, it, they were just uh, running wild, I guess, but they were only in a certain area. They didn't discover these chickens until they had explored some. And there was a time when in their exploring, or maybe they, there was a time when some fella broke an ankle or a leg or something. And, and it seems like that was tied to their exploring somehow in the, in the article. But the boys managed to uh, put a splint on and uh, the fellow that had the broken bone healed up eventually. And so they, they practiced medicine in a way be, um, be with themselves. What did they bring uh, with them to the island? What did, what, there were three things they brought, two of two were food items and one was a, a equipment. What did they bring? Bananas. Yes. Uh, coconuts. Yes. Well, they had a nut. Oh, a, a small gas burner. A small gas burner. I don't know if that gas burner would have lasted very long. Yeah. For them, uh, not not been helpful. They would not have been able to find gas fuel in order to, to yeah. make that work. And so, out of those just two meager food items, I, th I think they had a knife too. It's not listed here, but they did use a knife. It seems they later did. on in order to um, do some carvings of things. And they used some of the wreckage of the boat. Yes also right and they, they tried to make in, a raft what happened to that it's safe. Uh, it's got <laughs> it, 
Yeah, it sank. Right, they didn't get very far and it sank and apparently sank close enough to the island that they could swim back. So that, that did not work. Uh, and they rationed water. They didn't have enough water in the beginning and they, they were able to just take one small drink in the morning and the afternoon and until they figured out how to save water because this, this island was a much more uh, destitute, it seems like, than the one in Lord of the Flies. And, uh, right. There wasn't as much access till they found the fruit and stuff later on. And that right, right. Was better. Right. And, and they, they ate some bird eggs too before that, before they discovered the chickens, they ate some bird eggs. And that reminds me of some of the, some of the similar experiences. If you took, read the book, uh, the Big Reed book, In the Heart of the Sea, it describes uh, the experiences of the men that were temporarily on an island and how they uh, used birds and ate turtles and that sort of thing from the island to, to sustain themselves. Anything else? Let's see, anything else that you want to bring up about this. I think we've pretty much covered the essence of it. Well, um, they had to drink blood from the birds to get um, water or liquid. So they were, you know, they really were pretty desperate because I, it would take me a lot to have to drink blood to uh, give myself enough liquid, but uh, they did. They were able to, you know, do some things that were uh, pretty primitive to sustain themselves. So they, they, they were That's right. They didn't come upon that island right away. It seems like they were uh, on the, uh, on on whatever remained of their boat uh, for, for several days, maybe two weeks or so, and they became very thirsty and hungry at that point. So that island really was a lifesaver for them to, to come near enough that they could land there. You can feel good about the way the boys um, behave themselves on the island. You know, there's hope for mankind, but then <clears throat> that's sort of counteracted by the fact that the island was barren because they slave traders took all the natives away you know i mean that's sort of right um, right that harks back to an earlier time where where humans were not uh treating themselves in a fair way for sure mm -hmm. yeah right. so but i mean that it could illustrate yeah, a little extremes. bit of progress right, well, right. yeah one of okay. their advantages okay. was being island people to begin with so that their environment was definitely uh, harsh and not um, did not provide them all that they were used to. Still, it was more of a familiar environment. Mm -hmm. The animal would have been more familiar with the, the, the process of killing a bird and, and um, uh, with, in fishing would have been much more comfortable to them than it was for uh, Golding's um, um, Yeah, more pampered boys. boys so yeah. a, mm. Pretty, uh, well, you know, a, an upper class. Yes. It was interesting too. The uh, wealthy um, son of the whatever got a, got a new life too, and then he brought new life to the island where the boys were from because of the fishing and and changing changing some of the ways that they could earn money and and support themselves. So I thought that was kind of a win win at the end too because he didn't really want to live the life of a, just a wealthy guy in a in a business, and he got to do something that was worthwhile and uh, and good for the community. So. I thought that was a nice twist to the story too. And obviously that was true, so. Yeah, and and the, while they were on the island too, they did plant a garden. And I, they, they, uh, the ones in, in Lord of the Flies never got to the point of doing anything with planting things or anything. Yeah, it was just pig, relying on the pigs and maybe some fish mm -hmm. that they may have got uh, somehow. Any other comments about this? Uh, and uh, any other responses to this particular essay, news article, whatever? It was interesting what they gave us about um, Golding too, how he was mainly just a sort of a negative depressed fellow and that sort of fed into the writing of his book. Yeah, so, which begs the question, or at least the question of uh, all these Calvinists among us, does that mean that they, <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 they are naturally prone to depression or whatever, uh, hmm. have a negative point of view? I, I, and, and if so, where does that come from? Uh, I think that uh, there's Celtic strains of Christianity uh, that grow up in around uh, Scotland, Ireland, that have a much more positive um, mm. view of mankind. And, and I think that David Myers is familiar with that tradition. Uh, and, and, it, and it could be, it could be somehow tied to environment, your, your opinion about the, um, the nature of humankind. We talk about this more as we uh, go through the, the discussion of the book, though. But uh, just, I mean, 
it reminds me of Chaucer where uh, in one of the tales, uh, a, 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 someone has a bad dream and it's been blamed to the fact that he ate some bad food and, and that caused a bad dream and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Whether, whether it's, you know, it's just bad digestion <laughs> and affects your, affects your view of humankind or if it's something else. We, we can t keep talking about that and keep wondering, I think. I think I would like at this point to turn our attention to Shandong Compound. Mm -hmm. It opens with a little two lines of poetry and the if you go to that Roman numeral page, it's unnumbered, so it's about page 15 or something, just ahead of the first chapter. There's a, a couplet out of uh, Three Penny Opera by Bert, Bertolt Brecht. For even saintly folk will act like sinners unless they have their customary dinners. And, <laughs> and that uh, is a, perhaps a, a good summary of, of yeah. uh, this entire book because even at the end, and, and I will get to it more next time, but it's at first I thought it's, it's the people who are deprived that suddenly get very selfish. But later on, I think he comes to the conclusion that regardless of whether you're deprived or whether you have affluence, there is still in many people and many of us, uh, some degree more or less, uh, a, a very strong selfish uh, streak, a selfish uh, attitude, selfish motive, um, inclination, call it what you will, uh, that, that uh, interferes with the, it interferes with any attempts at building community, let's put it that way, to sort of summarize and walk into this book. How is it that um, people ended up at Shandong Compound? First of all, where is it in relation to Beijing? From what I understand, Shandong is about 200 miles south of, of Beijing. I don't have a map here, but um, people after Japan invaded China and World War II was coming to, the, to that country, uh, various groups of people that were not Chinese were gathered into various camps, such as the Shandong compound, which was before they arrived there, what was this used for, recall? What was, what was the place where they lived used it for? It was a Presbyterian camp or something like that, wasn't it? It was, a, it was the headquarters or the central location for a group of, of Presbyterian minis, uh, missionaries that were ministering the people in Shandong. And apparently they left at some time before this. Maybe they had word that, that uh, you better get out or you're going to be in trouble. And maybe they left maybe a year or so earlier and they left the place. But what condition was that camp in by the time that, uh, that uh, Langdon Gilkey got there? It was a mess because the military had been in there and destroyed everything. And Langdon came, came from, I think he was, he was teaching in Beijing as of, as, as my understanding or somewhere in the North. And he and many other people uh, described Describe for us uh, who are the people that come to Shandong Compound? Who, who are they? Where are they coming from? What are their backgrounds? Just to give a few uh, phrases on this. Well, there are 200 people, I think, that were Catholic um, priests and nuns. Uh, there were uh, American businessmen that were there, missionaries and whatever. Um, some other businessmen, British people that were there that had um, businesses and importers and um, oil tycoons and whatever. Um, so it was a really mixed mixed bag of people, people that had just been living in China under the under the kind of the British rule for a long time. And maybe they'd been there more than one generation. So just in them, uh, just everybody thrown together again. Um, and a so lot of- in, in some ways, this is like uh, the, the Lord, of, Lord of the Flies where you get people that didn't know each other before and now they have to get to know each other and build community, as opposed to the, the real life that we just talked about, the experience with the five boys, or six, five, whatever. Um, anything else about the, the differences here? How about languages? I was trying to remember if there were any uh, diplomats, any government personnel, 
or was it just this interesting mix of, of missionaries and uh, business people? Um, and university. Like two major ones. Oh, okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Jean. Oh, just some teachers from the university and a medical college. Mm -hmm. I don't think there were any diplomats for government I don't think people. So either. Right. And and Langdon himself, I think, would be among the teachers. I guess. I think he was uh, he was teaching, probably teaching English at at one of the universities there. Something. And let's see what else. Um, well, then after six months, some of the people left because I think the Americans, a whole group of Americans left, um, a whole group of uh, the Catholic nuns and priests left. So um, there were some people that were separated out and, and repatriated uh, early on, and then the rest of them were there for about three, what almost four years, I think. So it was a you know a long a long time. Okay, so their first uh, challenges were to create some sort of living conditions out of the mess that was made of this uh, camp. And uh, how did they begin to bring some order to their lives? Let's talk about some of the steps in the process. How what the about, alpha um, males started um, pushing their way around and in, in, in indicating that they were the top dog. That's right. That's described, I think, on... Oh, let's see. I'm on page 23 right now. One of the one of the problems that affected a number of them is that once they were removed from their careers and their businesses or whatever they were doing, they lost their their status. The the symbols of success, their social status, all those markers were gone and they suddenly had to learn some new skills. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of an equality. I'm on the bottom of page 23. Everyone was entitled to the same basic rations or rations and the same amount of living space. So they attempted some form of equality, trying to uh, be fair to everyone. And sometimes equality is not the same thing as equity. Sometimes some people need a little bit more than others for various reasons. And um, then we get, uh, let's see. Jockeying for leadership on about the middle of page 25. There was this jockeying among ourselves for leadership. And um, I'll read now on, let's see, uh, just a few words on pages 25, 26 and 27. There's some phrases that jump out. There was a struggle for the authoritative voice. And you know, it's sort of like who's going to be the top dog here among these men that sort of come together that feel like they might have the potential for being leaders. And so they talk and make plans and the qualities that were admired among the, these people that were potential leaders included the ability to think quickly and relevantly, um, self-confidence, uh, a firmness of will, personal energy. Those were some of the qualities that, that sort of rose, uh, caused the cream to rise into the top toward leadership. And uh, then you talk about uh, a hierarchy of leader of uh, power, but before committing, I'm reading now uh, top, the very bottom of 26, then top of 27. I think it, I'm not sure if this works still in, and probably does, but this is the, the process. A hierarchy of power had appeared as a few men attained subtle but real dominance. Now before committing themselves to an opinion, most of the 20, these top ones, waited to hear from these few what they would say. And when these men had made their statements or suggestions, the others would quickly fall in line. At this point, only the great dared challenge the great. The rest had given up the fight. They would mm -hmm. rather now be secure on the side of the winner than reach for the glory of power, only to find themselves defeated, isolated, and humiliated. So without any external force, even without a hint of a ballot, but only by quiet process of self-elimination, the list of contenders had been reduced to two or three giants who were still able to con contend for the role of Caesar. And uh, so it was a lot, a lot smoother process um, and more gentlemanly-like than we had on Lord of the Flies, where you had um, uh, the contention uh, between Ralph and... and uh, the other guy who just whose name's escaped me. Who's who's his channel? Well, Jack, 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 Ralph, and Jack. Well, there was, there was a hierarchy based on their education, 
uh, based on the number of British who were there as compared to the number of Americans, their role in society, how big their company was, how uh, impressive their company is, their, their title, all of those things. Um, I was just really impressed by how the author was such a wonderful observational uh, sociologist really throughout his writing, uh, um, really honing in on a lot of those um, types of things that we, we don't always notice. Um, in interactions between people. Right, he definitely is a student. I love his descriptions of a lot of the people that he talks about. Um, they, they, at some point, and I think the Japanese were helping us too, helping along. The Japanese said, we need to organize committees. And the Japanese had nine committees that they had. This is, I wrote this down about, this is information on pages 28 and 29. They had a social affairs committee, a discipline committee, a labor committee, education, supplies, quarters, medicine, engineering, and finance. Those were the nine committees. And then among them, there were um, ethnic groups. There were four groups, uh, people from Be uh, Beijing, uh, Tientsin, Tsingtao, and the Catholics. And so they made some arrangement that uh, of the four groups, each one would select, I think, one person, I think, to become part of that committee. And so you got a good representation just by that system that the Japanese had imposed on them, that you need committee uh, com committees. And uh, I think it, it seemed to work out pretty well, a ruling council. But then there was uh, vying for uh, a top one. Um, yeah, here we go. General Affairs Committee. That was mm -hmm. that was. Supposed the, the real top one and Jean's already laughing and smiling yeah. and so is Deborah. Tell me why you're laughing. Well because they were vying for it so hard and then they found out what you were actually going to do and then they didn't want to have it. <laughs> was yeah, like... what, they're, what, they're, what, they, what general affairs governed uh, was to rule over such things as the sports, the sewing room, the barbershop, the library, uh, and the canteen. Uh, <laughs> they, they were really, it was really <laughs> funny. They put all this effort into getting it, and then they like, well, exactly. I don't want exactly. that. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it was, there's some humor in here, and that keeps me mm -hmm. going to read it. Um, one of the big problems they started out with is, was the allocation of space and who decide, how to decide where people are going to live. And I think that Langdon himself was... He was uh, on that committee and maybe even headed it. So he had the headaches to try to resolve all of these power struggles over um, space. Uh, there was one situation where one woman in particular and it st stands out that at night she would move her furniture, or her bed, so that she would have a little bit more space around where she would be. And so other women were complaining about it to Langdon. And, and, and so uh, Langdon had to make peace with that. And I don't know if he ever did really resolve it. I think that woman was just a- No, uh, he, he drew um, marks around with chalk. Okay, okay, that was the method. And I did that work? For mm -hmm. a while until the chalk uh, got washed away. <laughs> okay, until he washed mm -hmm. <laughs> And I know from just from true life when, when uh, we've been involved in, in, in the companies I worked with, when we when people moved from one space to another, there were often these power struggles about who got what desk and where, you know, where the space was going to be. It's amazing. And I think human, re human resources had to struggle probably with a number of, of the kinds of uh, issues that surface whenever there's a move. Uh, it uh, sometimes brings out the worst in human nature about space and the importance of having enough space. Mm. Well, well, Judy, it, the topic I, of space, living space, was bringing a question to me, and I don't know if you want to go there yet, but it has to do with um, uh, the, his growing awareness that... Um, uh, to have a good government, you need to have some power and have some. That's force. right. Oh man, that's a and, that's a critical thing. And they didn't. And they, that's one thing they did not have. Um, and so he said, "You this governance is always a compromise. You want to do things according to your values, but you realize you can't. 
you have to compromise and go with what's uh, what the circumstances call for. I, the situation was when the newcomers were coming to the camp. Oh yeah, the Belgians. Yeah, let's let's talk the about Belgians. that. And somebody yeah, had 40, 40 Belgians. There are 40 Belgians, and we can't right. put them in the cold. So Langdon, you need to move. 40 people, or what? I, let's assume it's 40. You need to move 40 people. And um, so, what's is, what? How does he solve that? How, what first steps does he take? Well, he recognizes that that it would be a greater imposition. He he decided, and I, I have to trust him on this, that he had to move either the single men or the single women, a group of single men or a group of the single women. And what were the arguments for both cases? And what, what were the arguments? Well, his the way he the reason he felt that he should the right thing to do would be to move the men because they would be a far less uh, would it would be far less of an imposition on them than the women, um, and he just establishes that that is the thing they need to do. It is clear to him. Um, but the men will have would nothing. Be, why of would it be more it. of an so imposition? That, on, why would it be less of an imposition on the men than the women? I don't. I don't remember. But but there was some reason that he came to that conclusion that the right thing to do here is for the men to move. I think the um, women were a little older, and he just figured that they would be harder. They would be harder to move than the men. I. That's what I sort of remember. But yeah, he makes a statement at some time that the men have an easier time with the living because they just ignore each other because they know that um, they would have a tendency to <laughs> argue or fight. And I wonder if that uh, that ignoring would still <laughs> hold true in um, 2020. I don't know. We seem to have a lot of arguing and fighting amongst people. And, and it and maybe was that because they, they had this trouble with this woman with her space problem that he, he thought that the men would be a little bit more easier to, to move, more flexible and more adaptable and, and less set in their ways. Those those are the, some of the arguments that I thought would be in the back of his mind. So um, so he goes to the men. Where are we in here? Let me, um, we don't, I'd if, like to get to about the page where this is discussed and I'm, can somebody tell me about where this, uh, this discussion happens in the book? I was thinking it was in the chapter, A Place of One's Own, but I'm not okay. positive. Let me see here. I think it's um, yeah, it's it's in it's in a place of one's own, and I'd like to jump back into into. Let's look at some of the details in this chapter. If you turn to chapter uh, uh, the page seventy six, I want to read. Uh, he prefaces this uh, whole problem with. The statement, I began to see that without moral health, a community is as helpless and as lost as it is without material supplies and services. Moral health. And I think you get the idea that moral health has to do with uh, being able to live in community by denying one's self-interest. He talks about an intractability of the human animal uh, in uh, about the middle of the page 76. And then um, he says on the page 77, and besides, isn't it true that people are more apt to share with each other when they are in some common difficulty, like a life, like a raft at sea, than they are in humdrum pursuits of normal life? So I argued to myself as I conf conf confidently accompanied the delegates to Black uh, to Block 49. But um, he found that when he talked to the men and wanted them to move, that he gets some resistance. And what resistance came, um, I'll talk, well, let's, I'll read some of this on page 78, about the middle of the page. He made all these, what he considered rational arguments to the men about why they should be moving. And uh, 
These rational arguments were futile and would lead nowhere. Clearly the driving force behind the reaction of these men was not their intellectual doubts as to the justice of our proposed proposal, but on the contrary, the intense desire to hang on to their space. Something, something that uh, almost is a matter of their identity. The desire was at the root of the matter. It determined not only their emotional reactions, but to my wide-eyed surprise, it even seemed to determine the way they approached the issue in their minds. Uh, there was fear involved. There was a desire for comfort and security. And how do you argue logically about issues like comfort and security? That that doesn't something necessarily, it, it doesn't lend itself to reason or pro and con. Uh, but he wanted to be fair and generous. And so I'll read toward the bottom of that page for most. For did not most of our modern culture hold that scientific knowledge and technical advance could lead to social progress? Did this not imply that men who used this knowledge could be rational and just when they understood things clearly and through organized inquiry? But in Block 49, men understood. They understood fully. They understood that a reform meant their own loss. And so they thought that reform, whatever, whatever its rationality and justice, as if it were a plague, a poisonous thing, self-interest seemed almost omnipotent next to the weak claims of logic and fair play. I thought that's profound. And it's profound for, for mm -hmm. what has been my experience in our country, um, maybe even within you know, communities in the last year or so that so many people have been complaining about trying to reason with people on the so-called other side and, and finding that, that reason doesn't work. And he's discovered this very same thing here because he's, he realizes that he's dealing at a different level. It, it's not a level of, of reason and pro and con of, of, of sides and issues. It has to do with some deeper things that have to do with um, self-interest and fair play and people once they have position and power and, and space will not willingly give it up. That's, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, I think, a uh, part of the human nature that, that he's come to face. I think Gilkey himself early on had a pretty positive view of humanity. He actually thought there really people could get along without necessarily having a religion or a God that would somehow be uh, a kind of trump card for the side that's right. Uh, he, he thought that, that people he believed in progress. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's come to doubt that now as he's having to deal with some real difficult problems that uh, come up when he's dealing with people. Uh, the, the problems of actually setting up a kitchen and a hospital are minor compared to some of these other problems, like the one about we've got to find a place for 40 people that are coming in. Who is going to give up space and who's going to be willing to move? He eventually, well, what were some of the excuses that the men gave? Were, you, you recall what they well, said? Well, the, the issue that you're reading about there in a place of one's own is had to do, I think, with adding another man. Oh, so okay. Was, okay. So it's a different problem. issue. Let's, uh, let's move to, to, to the, the Belgians. That's that's in the next that's in the next well the chapter on sugar and politics I just okay okay we can on. jump to that well, let's jump to the sugar and politics chapter nineteen one twenty um, but um, one twenty is where he he makes his determination that it would he uses the word just that it would okay. not be just to ask these women to move and age was an issue I'm on okay. page one. Um, age was an issue and and the difficulty that they had in getting around the camp which is um, um, uh, the question can it be done is as relevant as the question is it right so it is okay, already where, where are you reading now what page on that uh, page 120 okay um, good good every humane consideration this is toward the coming toward the middle of the page, mm -hmm. every humane consideration led us to decide to leave the women alone and to tackle the 30 bachelors. If governments were run solely on moral grounds, 
this is what we would have done at once, but as we discovered, they are not. Power is also part of the political equation. The question, can it be done, is as relevant as the question, is it right? Um, Actually, so then the, the men's reasons were that um, they had sent their wives back <laughs> when they were told to. They had sent their wives back. These women should never have stayed in China to begin with. So mm -hmm. why okay. are we... Okay. Like, they should be the ones who be, should be uh, made discomfortable about this, this move. Don't impose on us. We did the right thing. Um, and anyway, they... Uh, that's, my, that, that's plausible, isn't it, gals? <laughs> that's plausible? <laughs> right. But it, it was just, it, they became rather recalcitrant. And then he, that's when he decides that you can't govern based on justice. You have to realize, you have to compromise that. And so... Um, so he moved the women because he realized that they had no way to force the men to move. But that's where I started beginning to have questions. I wondered, um, did he really give up all options? Uh, other, did he really consider everything else? Did he talk? Did he bring a representative of the men and the women together? Did mm. he help? Did he help the men see the situation of the women as real women, not just a category? Of, um, of people who should not have been there to begin with. <laughs> um, uh, and instead, he, he says, this is how you have to govern. You have to back down from your morals sometimes. Mm. Just go with what's in and it. What was more important, he said, was that the Belgians get out of the cold. So pragmatism, um, yeah, pragmatic so justice response. can be set aside <laughs> for the greater justice of getting these Belgians out of the cold. Um, and I, I just, I, I wanted, I wanted there to be um, more of an effort, I guess. <laughs> I wasn't quite as willing to, I don't think an eye in that situation would have been quite as willing to back down if I was convinced, like he seems to be, that it should be the men moving. He um, did go to the discipline committee on page 121 to see if they could move him out, but it didn't work. <laughs> And I think that those were all men too, though. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. I think that the earlier situation with the families and trying to get the families with the two teenagers to move to one room and have their kids move to the dorms, they weren't willing to do it either. I mean, it was space was really an interesting thing. Once you had some territory, they didn't really want to budge on it. It was it was like it was theirs, and uh, even though it was for the greater good, um, they they just um, couldn't do it. And it seemed though people that had more really hung on to it even even tighter mm. than those that had less. Because think of, think of these young couples with two little toddlers in nine by 12 space. I mean, that mm -hmm. just sounded just really incredible because they're probably still having to take naps. And um, yeah, I, it was, and then these old, other couples had teenagers like 12 and 15, they're out running around, um, but they, they wouldn't give up the space for these young families. It just, it was, that's one that really bothered me a lot. It's like, okay. Uh, you know, well, that was all they had that they could control there. Once right. they were given their space, that was it. They clung to it because that was some sense of control over their lives. Yeah, it was interesting. Which, um... They didn't have the, the, the forces that you would have in society to ensure um, justice, let's say. They, they had no clout. They, they, here you had responsibility, you know, we've got to bring these people in and we've got to bring some sense of order, but he didn't really have hmm. any, I mean, there, there were no, there were no prisons that, that they could put people in. And okay. if, if people were put in prison, I think that what comes up later on, they would consider that a privilege because mm -hmm. that means they didn't have they, they to work. Have, they'd have their own mm -hmm. space. They'd be by themselves. That's what it would be. I think exactly. So clever about like when the women couldn't get along and he found this one woman that was really strong and and, and able to uh, help the other women stay calm and uh, more placid and whatever. So he was pretty clever on how to solve difficulties. And he asked this woman and she was willing to help. She, she would move into the hornet's nest and say, okay, I'll try and, and uh, calm these ladies down. And, and it worked. And she stayed there till the end. So I thought that was really interesting. So he was pretty creative in trying to solve the problems. And um, not always what, you know, he, he was just thinking about what would work. And 
figuring out who who could help. And uh, I, I I got joy out of that that he figured out how to solve things sometimes with without having with not having to move too many people anywhere, but uh, still get the results he wanted. It's definitely he, a, a difficult problem to be in, really, to, to have the responsibility to have order, but not really have the tools in which you can enforce things. You couldn't find people, you couldn't put them in jail. Um, and so he's, he really has his hands tied. And so he has to come up with some very creative solutions. And often those solutions involved, as, as Sue pointed out, putting the right person in the right spot who is responsible. But didn't I he think, find, yeah. Go, go, Jean, go next. Didn't he find that shame didn't really work either? People were pretty nope. shameless. They didn't care. Right. Well, and I think it's important. he was able to make things work without jails because I think we have so many people in jail in this country and around the world that probably don't need to be in jail. If we could be more creative with some um, solution finding. Um, I was just reading this man in Michigan that got, got a lifetime sentence for three pounds of marijuana. And he's still in jail. He's been there for 20 years or something. And they're trying Is to- Is he a person of color? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I went to yeah. NPR this week, but it's just it's just kind of incredible. Why you would put someone in jail for a life sentence for having three pounds of marijuana is like in not a not an offense of, of uh, beating someone or using a gun or anything, just ha owner having it and selling it, I guess. But anyway, so they're saying that now since marijuana is legal, you ought to get out of jail. Definitely, so. long since, right, right. Well, what I wanna say is um, all of these ways to control people. I like, I like the cooperative movement or you could think about shaker communities where everybody has a voice. And in this particular situation, they didn't have that. They had a hierarchical mm -hmm. situation with the Japanese on the top and then, you know, the big wigs and kind of going down. And if they had actually had a more cooperative structure, it could have been an entirely different um, situation because people feel more committed to the whole. How, how would you go from a hierarchical to cooperative system? What, what steps would it take to, to make that well, transition? Well, I think they had some of that because every six months they changed. And at the end, people didn't want to have the leadership roles because it was too much work. Well, after they were there for a while, it, it's people that, um, so I think there was more cooperation because every six months they voted and people had to trade jobs or do something different. And then well, I think- What stick out to me, Sue, is women didn't have a voice. They had to work through the man that they were attached oh, well, to. Well, you're right. The women, did, the women didn't have a voice. You're right. No. I think the, I think the men had some sort of co-op because they, they did a lot of switching around. Like sometimes you were a stoker or you were a cook or you were whatever. And then uh, some of those jobs, it took more thinking and work. Um, they Some of the guys decided they didn't want to do anymore because it was too hard. There was no prestige in, in uh, working hard. Uh, and then some people really jumped up. Like when he was in the kitchen, he really liked it because they got better food and more creative recipes and they got make, actually were able to make some desserts. And it was interesting. Uh, but yeah, the women really, they right, they did not have a role in that society at all. You're right, Deborah. It's, um, yeah, and, and the, the, he, he, when, he, when he does make the decision on this group of Belgians that, that the women have to move rather than the men, he said that as always, the women, uh, he decided that we they would move the women because they're more docile than than the men, more docile. And so what this boils down to is is might makes right, and and even all the way back to, to Plato, there, there there was some some man in the Republic that said that whatever is just is whoever has the most power. He can exert his will, and that's what makes right. And the, unfortunately, that point of view has persisted through through off and on through history. Um, that that uh, it's 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 the powerful that 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 uh, win and and the, as Deborah points out, if you get more egalitarian and more uh, cooperative uh, leadership style, uh, you can counteract that song. I want to go back to uh, an earlier incident where um, the black market developed. And this is pretty early. I think we're backtracking a little bit. I don't know that we have to go to pages. We might remember this. But in what ways, what kinds of uh, foods and products came in through the black market? What is the black market? First of all, what is it? And, and what, what, were, what uh, 
what items came through on the black market? Well, this is the Chinese farmers uh, when they still could sell things over the fence so they could get eggs. Eggs was a big thing, vegetables, um, co commodities they could get from the Chinese farmers. And it, this wasn't the jams and peaches and stuff like that. This was things that they, they grew or they got from farm animals or maybe cigarettes, I'm, I'm not sure. But those are sort of the black market things, um, potatoes and vegetables and stuff like that. So, um, but then they, then they- How did they get started? How did they get started? You think it was uh, some of the Chinese approached maybe some of the in people on the inside or somehow there was a interaction that, that there was a communication established that there was a way to do the black market. I, I, I think, think it's working on the side coming in and then they realized they could sell stuff over the fence. But then once the Japanese got wind of it, then they drew that big thing so you, they couldn't do it anymore. You couldn't you, you couldn't reach the people on the other side. So that that's right. The there was a, a little bit of a humorous spot in there too, where one of the priests, I think he had, he had long robes. And so he, when, when uh, the inspectors were coming by, he just simply put the robes over whatever it was he was gathering. And, and the black market was, um, I think it's just a normal thing. It, it automatically develops in, in refugee camps and so on as well. And, and it's, it's, it's a, for people that have money on the inside and there are goods on the outside, there, there's a, often a way that comes about so that they can do business. Yeah, it's Deborah? Well, it was very clear how it first started because they said the priests were in a back area away from the guardhouse and somebody threw cabbages over. Well, oh, they yes, were, that's how it got started. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Well, they were chanting or something and um, <laughs> they immediately thought perfect. Yes. Again, it just really <laughs> a nice uh, coincidence, right? And, and it, the black market was affected because then they could get some things that were ordinarily scarce. But what does the black market do to the sense of morality in the camp? That he explores that too. That that people had had operated on the black market, uh, and then uh, it sort of drifted into some people who were working with stoking the coal stoves. They would end up taking some coal home to use for personal things. Some people that were working in the kitchen started to take things home. They called them perks, uh, little extra carrots for their own family. Um, the black market uh, worked, but then it seemed like it planted the seeds for um, actually stealing and thievery among the community itself. Uh, how did he resolve that or struggle with the, the whole problem of, of stealing? Well, one of the things is that people didn't feel like they were stealing from each other. They felt they were stealing from the Japanese. That's so right. A nice yeah. rationalization. Yes. Uh, yes. This, people rational. are very creative with rationalizing. Mm -hmm. Yes. I can, I, I'm not stealing from my fellow man. I'm feeling stealing from the Japanese and they're not giving us enough. So it's okay. But really what they're doing is stealing from each other. So if they, you know, if everybody took some out of the kitchen, they weren't going to have enough food to really cook with for the for the bulk of them. And you know, they I think he said there were fourteen hundred people there at one time. It was a huge group of people though. Oh yes, feed yes. and house and, and tend to. So, yeah, it was it was interesting and trying and you really couldn't get them not to do it. There was no way to stop it really. I and mean, he couldn't do their higher moral judgment or, or anything. Once once they felt that that was a perk of the job that they had, they were it was um, they they were guaranteed it and it was theirs and they should have it and and then no one else should tell them anything else about it. So it was a uh, and I think he really struggled with that for a long time because you know sometimes they didn't have enough meat or they didn't have enough uh, coal or enough anything and uh, the more lo longer it went on and finally they're getting close to the end of it. But I think the last six months he said that was really a desperate problem, but not one he could readily solve. And in, in trying to appeal to someone's moral judgment that they shouldn't do it did not work at all. It was interesting that earlier he made the observation that when, um, when he was talking about the jobs and the latrine um, and mucking out the routine, the latrine, that um, the people who were connected to the mission were more willing, you know, had a different sense of morality. They were more willing to do that kind of work for the group. And I don't know if that same observation would have applied 
um, to the stealing or not. I don't remember him if he addressed that. Well, I think one of the thefts was young. I think, and maybe this is the the training of the of the young in uh, deceitfulness. But then there was a man who discovered that because of his son's size, um, he could deal with the um, over the wall um, black market much more effectively. Um, so his his son was suddenly a very important person in this whole black market economy. Um, and in his, it was his son who was discovered to be a, uh, a thief um, later on, but he got his start in being needed um, uh, because he was more adept at, at climbing up the wall um, than any of the adults were. Right, so it, it's an example of that black market sort of being a, a, uh, one of the steps toward greater thievery going on. Uh, and, and it was hard to draw the line between the so-called good theft, you know, black market hits, that, that really didn't harm anybody that much, where people are paying for stuff, they, they, they pay the, the, the Chinese that were putting things over the wall, that's different from stealing from yourself and not paying anything for it. Mm -hmm. Well, there was also the intertwining of the uh, market of um, possessions with the guards getting dollars that they could then pay for the, I mean, it was a very convoluted system because they were using their dollars that they got from the guards to pay the Chinese farmers for the goods they were getting on the black market. And, it, and at one point they thought that they, if you just have enough guards, you, you can solve the problem. But yeah, they were uh, involved. <laughs> right. Then the, the, they, they, one of the, the chief guards was one of the chief th thieves. And so who's going to guard the guards? And so that, that sort of fell apart. I want to talk about the mixed blessing chapter that starts on about page, hmm, page about, it starts on page 96. And the mixed blessing had to do with Red Cross. Someone uh, summarized well, what that was all well, about. The Red Cross drops um, all these um, packages. And the first time they drop them, everybody's, there's not one for everyone, but they really share all the goods. The next time they drop them, well, there's there's like um, the Americans decide because it's from the American Red Cross, they should get all the packages. And so each one would get seven boxes. And so then they're trying and they're, they're saying, well, listen, there's enough for one box to go to every person here. So they have all this largesse and in it would be peaches and chocolate and cigarettes and jam and all these wonderful things that they weren't getting. But then there's this huge outcry for the Americans. And um, so finally, the Japanese decide how they're going to divide them up. And everybody does get one. And I'm not sure about what happens to the extra ones. But then some boxes are dropped that are from South Africa. And these boxes are all shoes. And so the <laughs> South Africans say, listen, you didn't want to share the boxes with us. We have all the shoes. <laughs> You're going to have to get shoes from us. So anyway. And it was interesting of the selfishness. Um, I can't even imagine because when my, my son was in the military in Iraq and he said when anyone got a package, everybody shared. And they had a lot of guys that were from poor families that never, never got anything. And he said, mom, when something comes, you know, we should mm. be with our whole group because, wow. um, and his um, wife at the time would, had a, con a contact with a dentist and would send toothpaste and toothbrushes and floss and all this stuff. And, you know, sometimes they, they, where he was in Iraq, they didn't have a PX. There was nothing you could get that you could go and buy. They were out in the desert. And so when you would send nuts or cookies or popcorn or whatever, and actually at one point we were sending stuff like um, the tuna fish and stuff in packages so you could make little sandwiches and stuff. Anyway, that was all shared because um, 
people didn't hoard. It was it was mm. interesting. And here, the whole sense of these people, I would be embarrassed to be eating all this stuff and these other people are, have hardly nothing. Um, anyway, I, it was an interesting phenomena of, of, um, of it's mine, not yours. And it, it just reminds me of this America first. We're going to oh, be, yes. we're oh, gonna yeah. take it all. We're not going to share with you. We don't need to be part of the world. It's all mm -hmm. for us and none for you. And mm -hmm. that whole sense of uh, right now, is, and I've heard people say, well, what, what's wrong with that? Well, <laughs> there's a lot wrong with that. <laughs> but anyway, but, uh, it's, it's interesting. I, but it's, it was interesting with the shoes because then they got kind of a taste of it back in some ways. And <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, I'm reading um, the, on page 102 um, after they were debating about how are they going to distribute the, the packages from the Red Cross. Two days later, uh, reading the first full paragraph on 100, 102, two days later, the Japanese authorities paste, paste, posted a notice which seemed to settle the issue to everyone's apparent satisfaction. The commandment after uh, the commandant, commandant, after stating that he was acting according to official instructions. So, you know, there's a kind of authority here. Um, he proclaimed that the parcels were to be distributed to the entire camp the next day at 10 a.m. Every American was to receive one and a half parcels, every inter internee, every other internee, one, one parcel. This ingenious distribution was possible because of their X number of parcels, X number of people, 20 of 200 of them were Americans. I was elated I regarded this as a master stroke of state, statesmanship in a touchy situation. Looked as though the whole camp would be well fed by the arrangement. <laughs> at the same time, uh, the super patriots among the Americans would be appeased because they were getting substantially more than the so-called damn furners. Um, mm -hmm. But then, you know, and again, it's the Japanese that come up with this equitable solution. This is the so-called enemy. They uh, are at some points, they, they are uh, an authority that is really uh, worth following. And everything is fine until um, there is a sign that was put up due to protests from the American community the parcels will not be distributed today as announced. Well, that caused a big uproar. And it turned out that there were only seven young Americans that went to the commandant and protested. And uh, for that reason, uh, the whole thing it, it fell apart. The whole the whole plan unraveled there. And uh, then trying to make some justice out of that. Uh, um, all the way on to later on the South Africans, you know, with all their boots, they they uh, they put their sign up at one point. I'm reading now 113 toward the bottom. Due to the pre precedent that has been set, the South African community is laying claim to all 200 of their boots donated by their Red Cross. We shall there wear each pair for three days to signal our right to what is our own property and then shall be glad to lend some out when not in use to any other non-South Africans who require our generous help. Mm -hmm. uh, parody, satire on, on what the Americans had done. Uh, Excellent. And he, he's got all these good details in here. Um, any, any other observations or comments that you want to make about uh, this particular part? I want to not get into what we are going to cover next week. So are there any comments or things that jumped out at, at, at you as you were reading uh, up to page 141 that, that you want to bring up for uh, discussion or you thought it was uh, particularly good insight or something you don't understand you want to talk about? I was amazed by the description of the hospital and his um, treatment there. And um, it seemed like the people the medical people really had their stuff together. Um, they didn't have all of these infighting and placeholding situations. Okay, why did he have to go to the hospital? Let's get the, you recall um, that. He the was cleaning and he slipped and he stepped into a pan of boiling water, and burned his feet. A cauldron, yeah, yeah, right, right, burns, okay, yeah. 
And could it be because the people in the hospital, um, maybe were the were most of those the missionaries? I, I'm I'm not sure whether that that worked out better or or if, if people who are drawing to drawn to wanting to care for other people's have a, have a built in. Uh, gene for unselfishness. <laughs> Could that? Be? No, I think it has to do with commitment. You know, ah. they were committed to their profession. And um, when, earlier, when I mentioned a cooperative, if you were actually going into a cooperative, you would have or co-housing unit or something like that. You would have a commitment to that, which um, was lacking here. I mean, this was enforced. Um, closeness, residency. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Now, I think he did mention the difference between uh, some of the Protestant missionaries and the, the Catholic group. There was a difference in willingness to help uh, and not so much. Uh, there was, I think there was a lot of judgmental uh, behavior on some of the missionaries and more religious people. Some of the hard workers would swear or say something or maybe they think it was inappropriate and they would think they were bad people. Right. But um, in the group, they were really hard workers and worked for the good of all, but they were judged to be um, bad. And some of the other people were a little more open to um, and, and not judging so much and, and not being so pious and saying, you know, I'm, I'm, kind of religiously or spiritually better than you are and whatever. I, it, it was interesting, the dichotomy there of, of um, thinking and um, people that supposedly should have been generous and cooperative and whatever were uh, sometimes at least likely to be. That's um, right. That surprised him. It really did surprise him. And it's interesting because he said in, in, he was a more of a Christian person earlier in life and then in college and whatever became more of a humanist. And then um, as time goes on, he's kind of it's, uh, struggling with what his view of, um, of um, moral character is. Uh, and it's, it's interesting because he said some of the people that um, acted the most pious were the, were the least cooperative and were the least able to give and to share. And, um, and, and, and they actually even worked. Some of them just really didn't feel um, they didn't have to, they didn't want to. So it was, it was interesting. He, he did a lot of um, kind of um, contemplating about where people, and, and he really talked about if you don't get people willing to cooperate and have a government and work together, you have anarchy. Right. The only, the only way you have that is everybody making a commitment to working together and having solutions. And there wasn't a lot of that there. Um, and so there, they didn't have any um, force to make people to be their best person. It, it really depended on their own moral character to begin with. And, and just being um, supposedly Christian in thinking didn't mean you acted like a Christian. And so that was, was, was really, I think it was a, a disarming for him. Right, there was one situation, I think when he was trying to get somebody to give up something and he said that if I would do this willingly then it would be something good mm -hmm. for me to do. But if I'm compelled to do it, that's that doesn't count. Uh, you're, you're not you're not pleasing to God if you're doing something because you're compelled to do it. You have to do it on your own free will. And it's because you didn't feel like you wanted to do it on his own free will that you didn't do it. Uh, and and it's again a kind of kind of a, a, a really twisted rationalization for trying to justify himself. Yeah, lots of rationalizing for their behavior. That wasn't mm -hmm. really, um, such great behavior, but they always had a reason for it. There was always some sort of excuse that why they why they couldn't be more generous or more helpful or or whatever. It, it was it was interesting. It, uh... You're talking of compelling uh, a force compelling you to do something as being a factor. Um, I I wanted to to find some ways to bring in the fact that um, uh, I. Uh, I want to call it a higher power in, in some sense. The situation is, is, is unique in that they are kind of like a social studies laboratory um, because there is somebody in a scientific experiment. You watch a bunch of rats in a maze. Um, these folks have this higher power of the Japanese presence around them. You know, they, they, they don't have, they've been compelled to live in this place. Um, 
they've com been compelled to organize it themselves. Um, how does that affect their decision making and the expressions of human nature, as opposed to say on Golding's Island, where they are they very much aware that they are alone. You know, there's a little bit of mystery involved with the, the beast and et cetera. Um, this Beelzebub or uh, Lord of the Flies thing, but basically they they aren't being they're acting as if they are the gods of their universe now, uh, whereas these prisoners, let's call them, are not. <laughs> they're not the gods, and they were got they were brought there in a very humiliating way. I mean, they were living independent lives, and now they're being coerced. Um, uh, by another people <laughs> to live in these dire circumstances, how does that affect one's uh, behavior to know mm. that you are, you no longer have your freedom? Um, I want to know how long were they just considering this to be a discomfort for a short period of time and it will soon be over? Or was there a real despair um, that uh, kind of immobilize. That's 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 a very broad <laughs> um, topic, but um, that's a that that's what affected me in this book. That whole process of leaving their homes, leaving behind their stuff, their pretensions of being able to have as much stuff as they wanted, and being led through this city as prisoners mm -hmm. of war. You know, um, how how would that feel? Um, you know, we get movies every once in a while that, that, about the Russians in, invading, taking over the country, or aliens from outer space. Um, but, you know, we have not been in that kind of situation. Um, no, but um, Phil, we had this in, Cal in with the um, Japanese in America. Right. They were all interned during World War II. They were gave up their houses. They were American citizens. We did the same thing right here in the United mm. States. I mean, so, I'm aware of that, but, but you know. I mean, but it's it's interesting because it's it seems so strange there, but but we as a as a community and and a, and a government did the same thing to people living right in our own country, and that we're Americans. Right. And we're doing it right now with the refugees coming from Central America. They're in internment camps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're separating families. I was listening to NPR last night and there's one family with a, a daughter that's separated from all the rest of the family in Virginia or someplace that's, um, yeah, it's very sad. I mean, it's it's not just then, it's now. And, and we, um, when you think of how much it costs to keep a person in jail, like $35,000 a year, and we're keeping all of these people that we're separating out from their jobs to send back to another country that they've been here for 30 or 40 years, I, I can't get my head around that. I really can't because just because they've been here and they came as children or whatever, and now we've decided they have to go back. All the people that came during the, the uh, crises in the eighties, we decided need to get sent back to Haiti and whatever because they, they had partial, they never, they were here on green cards for emergencies. They built a life here. They have homes here. They've had jobs here. They have families here, but here we are, we're, we're doing it again. I mean, I, it's just, I think it's, it doesn't matter uh, which society you're in, we're all capable of it. And that's, that's what's so frightening to me. It, it seems like, you know, when it's done to us, we don't like it, but we're doing it to others. And we don't seem to be able to have the empathy to put ourselves in the shoes of the people that we're doing it to. Uh, that that yeah, lack yeah. of there are descendants of the uh, Holocaust who have been speaking up very vociferously about the border situation in, in immig immigrants. Does it require, since I, as a member of the dominant culture, have never been in that prison camp situation. Um, I have been in prison <laughs> or jail, but never in that kind of long-term, um, suddenly my life has been taken away from me. That, that situation, I've never been in that. Does that make it hard for me to uh, sympathize with people who are right now living that? You know, I know they're there on the border, but I don't let them affect my daily life. Um, 
Well, I think I think we all have to think because I've heard people say, well, they should just stay where they are. But then when you read about what's happening in Honduras and Guatemala, well, if you listen to the um, World Affairs talk um, of the gangs there, the lack of food, the lack of housing, the, the danger there, uh, people are fleeing for their lives. And if, you know, it just depends upon where you're born. We could have been born in Guatemala or in Honduras or, or in wherever and it, we it's the luck of the draw we just happened to be born where we are with a lot of affluence a lot of space a lot of everything but if you go around the world in any place that's that's a third world country uh, i always come home feeling very guilty i i we have so much and we don't even appreciate it uh, hardly at all and uh, and it's sad and then we blame the people for some of the problems that they have and some of it we've caused ourselves by our uh, we we took away all the funding out of those countries to help them fight wars and gangs and stuff and and then they want to come here so it's <laughs> we get the double mm. board yeah it's mm. it's hard well we're hoping if we elect another set of leadership things can change that's about the only the hope that, that we can have, I think, at this point, uh, unless, you know, individually uh, contribute to various causes that will improve the lives of people in, in poverty. And we'll really be careful of that because Obama really started a lot of the uh, moving people out during his, his last term, too. So it's it's not only just the Republicans. It's mm -hmm. been in, in both administrations. But anyway, we just have to think about the other. And, and I'm just thinking about so many people in jail. Um, do we really need to have that many people in jail and, and for what reason? And, and do we rehabilitate them when they come out? And that doesn't seem like that's been a purpose. It's just locking people up for, and it's become a business actually. I mean, prisons are a business now. And uh, anyway, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard. Mm. Phil, did we answer your concerns enough? I think we, we took some, well, I, some, some I, digressions I from that. I got kind of carried away, and uh, and we went into this direction of um, uh, being able to empathize. But I do have a kind of a, a scientific or an objective interest in knowing how that trying to make trying to live in like a, a fishbowl or, or or trying to live in a a um, laboratory controlled by somebody else. How does that affect these questions of human nature, the expression of human nature. Um, how were these folks different? Um, how did they respond differently than if they were on a, on a couple of planes that crashed on a deserted island and yeah, had to yeah. make food? Um, okay, so, the, so the knowledge that they have that the Japanese really in control of this situation, right. is that a comfort to them, or is that uh, something that is making things more painful for them? Frankly, the way that the, that the Japanese decided how the goods would be distributed, that, that saved the day until the Americans objected to it. Uh, in some ways, I, I, I think that they, they got along pretty well with the, the Japanese that were so long. The Japanese, all they wanted is to have this, this, uh, this, this camp in an orderly way, no, no revolutions, no people running away. And, and the Japanese were happy if they would just uh, govern themselves and, and peacefully. And, and I think that the people that were there were in some ways grateful that the Japanese weren't more cruel to them. And so uh, it was kind of a benevolent uh, uh, ownership or, or leadership there. I wonder why they did treat them as well as they did. Well, I think it was in an internment camp rather than a prison camp because these people weren't weren't the enemy. And so I think there was some talk about that. But I think the Japanese were smart, though, because they let them organize themselves and run it themselves and they had to do the work themselves. So people were responsible to each other to make it work. Uh, and so there, there wasn't a lot of pushback to the Japanese because the leadership of how this place ran really depended on the people that were in it most for most of the minor decisions anyway or most of the decisions you know like the housing and the food and how you ran the kitchen and how you ran the hospital so um i thought that was pretty good they did kind of a hands-off um, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. government yeah so i think it has to do back to the experimental base with the number of um people because um 
you had a very small space with lots of people coming from different backgrounds. And that was a very different situation than either of the two island situations where there were a few people on a, not a big space, but a bigger space where you could, um, you could have privacy. You could go off by yourself and there was none of that. And I don't think humans work very well mm. um, in that kind of an intensely um, populated mm. area. Yeah, think of it, 2,000 people are there, 1,700 or whatever it was for a lot, a long time, but not much space. And if you're living in something that's nine by 12, in those dormitory rooms, obviously with all those beds for those people in one room, um, you wouldn't have any, although people went for walks. I think they said in the evening when the weather was better, they would go out for walks in the evening and they sort of figured out a way to find some privacy or to private time but it was really hard you didn't it wasn't uh, wasn't easy and then the winter time that was harder yet because it was cold and snowy and whatever the subtitle of the book is the story of men and women under pressure <laughs> the pressure the pressure is no privacy right. too many of us not enough space not enough food uh and and so uh yeah pressure and pressure, I, toward the end of the book, it seems like he uses that word more often than he does in the beginning. Yeah, I think the last six months are the hardest for, for them. That, um, and we'll get to that next week. Yeah, it was a good book. I, I was not realizing how interesting this was going to be. It's a really good read. And so it's a lot about philosophy and, and um, uh, how we think about life and, and what what determines our um, activities and actions and um, um, you know it's, it's it's interesting it was I, I really enjoyed it and I think next week we'll explore two more uh, what 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 motivates people and what gives people life meaning uh, there, there was a, a, a book written that I was thinking about when I read parts of that uh, Victor Frankl who was a survivor of the Holocaust wrote a book called man's search for meaning based on some of his experiences in, in, a, in a prison camp, uh, concentration camp in, in Germany. And that uh, has some reverberations with me as I read the last half of this book. And we will discuss that next time. I, I'm seeing that we've got about two more minutes. And uh, yeah, Deborah, you have your hand up? You yeah, I have this one quick thing. I'm wondering if next week we can discuss for a little while of uh, implications in our current situation where yes 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 okay good so be thinking about that you know as you're reading the the last half how how, how does this is similar in some ways to some things that we're going through right now and and how uh, can we learn anything from from what Lang, langdon gilkey learned from his experience that we can apply to our own uh and or or irrespective of the book itself can we talk about some of the things that we're going through right now uh, as a country and uh, share, share good ideas among ourselves. I appreciate all of your comments today and uh, it's been very fruitful. And so I look forward to our gathering again a week from today. Now, I have a hard time that when people think that uh, only people that um, are, are Christian can lead good lives. Okay, that's a that's a good discussion. And and can can pe can people be good if there is no God? Uh, Dostoevsky and, and the brothers Karamazov raises the question: if if there is no God, then everything is permitted. Now mm -hmm. that's not true. That there is not that's not true because you can have a higher power, but it doesn't have to be a Christian God. It doesn't have to be a Virgin Mary. It doesn't have to be a Virgin Birth. It doesn't have to be all kinds of things. So it doesn't mean that you're aimless or you're not without spirituality. And I think I think a lot of people um, don't give people credit for that because there there is another way of thinking and you can be just as moral and maybe even more moral because you're not as judgmental and you don't have this always looking for eternal life you have to live a good life right now for now uh, i think and, he would agree with you on that i think he really would yes, yes. So anyway, we can talk more about this next week so yeah um i know bye for everyone uh, bye. Kim, any, anything from kim that you need to say to us Kim's just joined us. <laughs> deep, deep questions and discussion. 
<laughs> well, it's nice when you have a small group like this. It's a really fascinating book. It really was. It's, uh, it is. It's got some right, and I, I like, uh, I mean, it is like sitting around the conference room back in the old great conversations days uh, where, where we can just jump in and, and uh, it, it's, it's like we're all around the table. I love this, uh, this, this means. And, and yeah, this we can nice. see everybody's faces and see some of the nuances of their expressions about what we say to one another. And uh, I love it. So mm -hmm. I'm glad that uh, we can do Zooms. Yep, great. Well, thank you, Judy. It's All right, thank you. Welcome. See you all next bye. time. Bye, guys. Bye. -bye. bye.